a visitor that is kind of important. So is this is this a live interview scheduled? Um, kind of. We have some questions that were collected from a forum, and then we have some people here who want to ask a couple questions. Okay, and, um, right. I'm, I'm really so sorry. Let, let's proceed. No problem. And yeah, okay. uh, I, I may have to bring to a close, and I just I can't apologize enough for that. I know that it's That's, difficult to get these things all okay. arranged. Uh, but essentially, two, two things have happened today that are just uh, beyond our control. Yeah. And there's a bunch of fires over there. So it's, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Plenty um, of fires. So just a very quick introduction. This is Dr. Gordon Lithgow, and he's a, um, he's a very established researcher for uh, the aging field, and um, he works at the Buck Institute. And uh, we're going to just launch into some uh, questions here. And the first one is going to be, um, do you see an easier path to regulatory approval through previously well-characterized supplements that may slow human aging? Well, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, the fastest route to an FDA approved drug is going to be a, a repurposed uh, drug that we already know about, things like rapamycin or metformin is, all, is obviously the, the quickest way forward. I mean, in, in terms of supplements, I mean, this is an unregulated area, completely unregulated. Um, it's also an area that is difficult to really get um, patent uh, protection on. Um, so, you know, some companies are out there are certainly trying to do that with various formulations, but but it's not easy. Uh, many of the natural products and supplements, there's already a, a cloud of, of patent material around them. So, I mean, unfortunately, um, it, it's, it's just very difficult to really bring something to market unless someone's going to make a whole bunch of money out of it. And, and to do that, um, you, you have to be very careful. I mean, I think with supplements, I think it's great. We, we just published last week uh, a natural metabolite that seems to extend lifespan in mice and compress morbidity and it's fantastic you know and it's great and there is a company out there that sells some formulation with that in it um, so I mean I think that's all great but 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 you know un until we actually do double blind clinical trials in people I don't think we should be claiming anything about anything that's a, a supplement right now. Um, I'm going to open it to someone who seems to have to go pretty soon and then and then I'll go back to the forum questions. Did someone have a, a question that I wanted to ask? Who is it? Um, so one of the guys that left Joseph had left me some questions to ask on his behalf. Um, he was very interested in what was the cause of protein misfolding um, in healthy individuals. So he was referring to some of your research with you know amyloids and protein misfoldings. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can take that one. I mean, the, 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 the what we found, and it's not in people yet, although we are looking at human serum samples now, is that there's a, a proteomic wide um, protein insolubility that happens during normal aging, and the, the list of proteins is incredible. I mean, it's, it's thousands of proteins, and they're all behaving biochemically like A beta would in an Alzheimer's brain, or alpha synuclein would in a Parkinson's brain. So you've got lots of, lots of proteins that become insoluble during normal aging. And when we look at the list of the, what those proteins are, they're enriched for proteins that we know determine lifespan in, in worms, at least in C. elegans. So most of our work is done in C. elegans. We're beginning to do some work in mice. We haven't looked at human protein insolubility yet, but we are doing so with our collaborators now. And, and, to, and to, the, to the question, what causes this? We have no idea. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, whether there's an Achilles heel and, you know, something like autophagy is, clearly autophagy is required for uh, lifespan extension in many circumstances. So it's definitely really important. Um, whether there's an Achilles heel, a particular pathway that regulates chaperones and so on, uh, we, do, we don't know. Um, and I, I suspect it won't be one thing. I suspect it's the interaction of many aging processes together. Um, his second awesome. question. The second question was: oh, yeah. um, Has there been any work towards artificial uh, prote proteasomes? Um, and I think that was his only two. Sorry, say that. Say that one again, please. Um, has there been any work towards artificial proteasomes? So maybe I'm mispronouncing. Oh, it. artificial um, proteasomes. That's an interesting idea, huh? Um, yeah, I, not, not, not to my knowledge. Uh, I mean, again, that's another big important pathway in protein degradation. And um, 
you know, there, there's probably a whole bunch of compounds that activate that pathway. We certainly know about autophagy activators, uh, and th those are actually quite incredible in their, in their biological effects. So upregulation of those processes is not always, not always at all, but, but in some circumstances going to be advantageous. And I say that, for example, since um, if you look at sarcopenia, uh, actually autophagy was a target for drug development to downregulate autophagy in conditions like that, where you've got muscle wasting and you, you're trying to reduce the turnover of, of molecules in the cell. So I think this is true for almost all the aging interventions. There's going to be circumstances where it's great, it's beneficial, you protect against disease, but there's also going to be circumstances where you're actually tilting it the other way and you're, you're doing some harm. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a question here concerning uh, a 2014 paper that you put out, which uh, had a geroscience hypothesis that was advanced in your 2014 paper. Um, he's asking, are you confident that the conservative medical community will be able to adapt to that hypothesis? Ah, great question. Um, well, we, we haven't seen it yet. Uh, we, you know, we still, and, and, and it's not too surprising. I mean, people devote their careers to individual diseases and individual tissues. Uh, people present with symptoms that, that are then put in a box and given a name for a particular disease. And what geroscience is, is really saying is that actually most of human chronic disease in late life all stems from one cause, and that cause is aging. Now, to take that on board, just think of every cancer center, every neuroscience center, just think of the NIH and it's the way that it's funds in silos. And think about the, the general organization of biomedicine is disease specific. And what we are saying is, well, you don't have to think like that. You, you can think about a single cause, a single target, and with the potential to have benefit in multiple disease states. That's going to take a long time for people to really, really take on. Now, what I'm really encouraged about is that when, when we sort of, you know, interview um, younger people like yourself to, for uh, grad students, postdoc positions, they get it. They, they've actually taken this on board already. So it's, it's, it's really the more senior people and the sort of organization that, that hasn't really taken this on. But uh, I, I think more and more we'll, we'll see this as being something that, that, that people can bring into the research and bring into therapy development. Um, next question is, what area of research outside of your own are you most excited about? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, 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 at the Buck Institute, where, where I am based, you know, we have uh, uh, seminars every Friday. Of course, we used to be in person. Now we're doing it worldwide on, on, on the web. And, and um, I, I am always in awe of, of the, the sort of molecular biology or biochemistry people who are focused on single mechanisms. Like, for example, Martin Brand at the Buck is an expert on mitochondria and where the sites of free radical production and how to suppress those free radical production sites. And it's based on, uh, a, you know, incredibly deep knowledge of biochemistry around, you know, single systems. I love that stuff. I could listen to Martin uh, all day. Um, and and our, our work has gone a different direction because we've been interested in lifespan, essentially. Um, we're, we're trying to find genetic and pharmacological interventions that change lifespan. And that's kind of messy, to be honest. You know, it's, 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 it sounds easy. We can certainly do it. We can reproduce it between labs. We can do that. But, it, but it's, it's not the exact sort of molecular sciences that I thought I would end up doing. Now, now we do, of course, do some molecular mechanisms, but um, it, it's, not, it's not the kind of stuff that Martin does. And so that's, that's what I really enjoy is, is hearing someone talk about a molecule that they've been working on all their life you know, and they know they, they are the one person in the world that knows everything about it. And that's, that's very cool. Um, you recently put out a paper, which seemed to take a while to get the data for that about uh, alpha ketoglutarate. Yeah. Um, do you want to speak to that? Sure. I mean, this came from, uh, you know, other investigators already published that extended lifespan in, in worms in the C. elegans model that we work with. And it just kept coming out of screens that we were doing on natural product libraries um, for, for different aspects of, of, of sort of aging biology. 
And uh, at some point we thought, well, you know, this, this probably could be tested in mice. And we, we did get funding from a foundation uh, who, who were interested eventually in commercializing uh, something like this to have a look at some natural products. So it was one of the natural products we started to look at in mice. And um, we, we, we didn't have a huge amount of resources to bring to this. And we, we thought, what can we do here? We can measure lifespan. Uh, we can't do the comprehensive bone and heart analysis that you know is certainly technically possible, but we just didn't have the resources to do it. And around about that time, Susan Howlett had published uh, a paper uh, out of uh, University of Nova Scotia on the idea that you could actually look at frailty and, and frailty's uh, concept commonly looked at in, in people by geriatricians. You know, you make various measures. How fast can you get up out of a chair, walk across the room? You know, so simple measures that are non-invasive and and Susan's lab published a whole bunch of these uh, things for mice that were sort of for the most part clinically re relevant and we thought well we can do that you know we can we can we can look at mice every week or so and see what's going on and we did and and the 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 amazing thing was that yes well AKG which is in the TCA cycles so is a natural metabolite uh, the production of that metabolite goes down with aging in humans uh, I think by about tenfold actually and so we had the mice from late, late middle age on a diet containing AKG, on you know, a control diet, and they lived about 15 to 16% longer, which is not huge by any means. But what was startling, and, and you know, if, if anyone's interested, have a look at one of the photographs that appears in that paper of a, a mouse, a control mouse on normal diet, and then a mouse on the AKG. The control mouse in that picture, and it's fairly representative, is um, it looks old. I mean, it's, it's got gray hair. Uh, you can see that it's losing its fur. You can see that its, its back is a little hunched over. And sitting right next to it is a jet black mouse that is the same age. And it, it's just one of those things where you look at that and you think, that's unbelievable. I mean, that, you know, even if it's just coat color and, and hair loss and things like, you know, su potentially superficial things like that, it is saying that this is a, this is a metabolite that's having a, a large biological effect in these animals. So, yeah, so we published in Cell Metabolism, and I think, you know, we, we, we were um, put through the, the mill of review uh, quite hard on this one, and I think quite rightly, um, because uh, these are fairly subjective measures of health. But the, the, the power in the analysis came from looking at the same animal time and time and time again, and so you can get a tra trajectory of its change with age. And then we take all the, all the different scores, was 31 different, different aspects of aging that we looked at. You put those all together into a single score, and I genuinely think you're capturing something interesting about health. And the take home was that, yeah, these animals are living longer, they're healthier for longer, and the period of sickness at the end of life is being, is being contracted. Um, that's amazing. Like, you know, I never thought, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, right? And I got into this because of purely curiosity about what aging was. I never thought I'd be talking to someone saying, yeah, not only can we extend lifespan, but we can reduce the period of sickness. And, and, and biologically, I, I don't understand that, but that's what we're seeing and it's, it's very cool. Um, I'm gonna open up to uh, some other questions before I keep going with the, the forum questions. Does anybody have uh, something that they wanna throw out there? Got. Uh, that's okay if you don't. Oh, okay. Um, what made you decide to work with anti-aging as opposed to maybe other medical fields that you could argue is a little more lucrative? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I, um, so I did my PhD in, in yeast molecular biology and um, I was just interested in biological processes. And I, at some point I became aware, and actually I, I know exactly when it happened. It was Tom Johnson from the University of Colorado published the first mutation the extended lifespan in an animal, and that was the, the age one mutation in, in C. elegans in, in the nematode worm. And I read that paper and I was sitting on the floor at the time. If I'd been sitting somewhere else, I'd have probably fallen off the chair because I just was like, wow, what? We, there are genes that determine how long we live. And, um, and you know, within weeks, I was contacting Tom's lab and saying, I want to come over and work on this age one mutant. Um, and at that time, and actually, for quite a bit of time after that, I was not interested in, in, in medical issues at all. I had no interest in disease. I had no interest in humans um, and their weird biology. I, I just wanted to understand how it could be that a, a mutation of a single gene 
could have such a profound effect on lifespan. In this case, it was like almost doubling the lifespan. So it was purely curiosity driven research. And there's definitely people come into this field who, who see disease in their own family, uh, who you know are, 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 are greatly influenced by the, the desire to do something positive for, for people. And that's great. That's just not where I came from. I came from uh, pure biology, curiosity. But the thing that's happened is that I've got to the point where I'm looking at the, the biology in the lab and I'm thinking, well, if this really is the case that aging is a cause of chronic disease and we can manipulate aging with, with compounds, why aren't we doing that in humans? Why aren't we trying to, to, to prevent Alzheimer's or cancer by, by intervening in aging pathways? So I've kind of evolved, <laughs> if you like, a long way from, from where I started in this. Um, what, what has it been like to communicate your research to the public? Um, is it like positive feedback or is it mostly just sort of people who you know, aren't quite open to that research just yet? Yeah, um, no, I mean, I think I, I, mean, I personally have always tried to communicate our science. Um, you know, in newspapers, media, TVs, documentaries, and, and so on. Um, I'm not out there seeking attention, but but certainly if someone asks, then we will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron, I need to cut this short now. Um, but cool. yeah, right. just to say, yeah, I'm, I really apologize for this. It's, it's uh, okay. unprecedented set of circumstances. <laughs> no, no I'm problem. absolutely happy to take any questions offline and uh, and communicate with anyone by email. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for your time and thanks for spending some time with us today. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Well. thanks for your interest. All right. All right. Take care. Take care.